Hello, welcome back. Today I'm doing one on cassette beat switches. What's a cassette beat switch? Well, it's a switch on a cassette deck. Mostly the older ones, as it happens, and it's marked beat. Or on a video that uh, Westlife did last week, it was actually called bias mode. But anyway, they all do the same thing. But are they the same as the MPX switch? We just did a video on a little while ago. Well, I'll tell you in a little bit. Let's just find out what they are and where we go from there. I spent ages looking and this is the only reference I can find to a beat cut on the internet that is actually visible. When I was doing the research for this video I came across this little clip it and it's obvious from this that some people think they know what they're doing and they don't. It's easy done because even I had got it wrong slightly. So this guy says I've got a 40 year old cassette player and the back of the switch, the back of it's a switch marked beat defeat. It has two positions on or off. What does beat defeat do? And the answer he got there from somebody is almost right, but not quite. He mentions FM reception and trying to get rid of the beat frequency from the multiplex. That's not what this does. Because it's an obscure switch, it's a common problem, so we'll go from there. And I'll explain why there's a difference between what some people think they do and what they actually do, and what the actual effect of them is. Sometimes they're very much the same, sometimes they're different. But it's important to know the difference because they're not the same. God, that sounds a bit... Anyway, let's try and keep it simple. I'm going to have to do some technicalities, but uh, I'm going to put chapter marks in, so if you find yourself getting to the yawning point, well, you can always forward on to the next chapter and have a yawn there instead. All right, the answer this gentleman gives is it changes the frequency of the tape record bias oscillator. This oscillator is an essential part of the recording on magnetic tape to overcome inherent non-linearity of the tape itself to give low distortion. The issue is that when recording from radio, the audio can contain residual parts of the carrier signal or the stereo pilot tone for FM broadcast, and these can sometimes beat with the bias oscillator to produce an audible squeal. The beat defeat switch shifts the oscillator frequency such that any beat frequency is outside the recorded audio band. The actual frequency of the BIOS oscillator isn't too important, so changing it doesn't affect the recording. BIOS oscillators typically run at something like 107 kHz to the beat defeat, so which might change that to 120. So if the first setting produced a 2 kHz peak tone, the second would shift it to 15 kHz, which is too high to be recorded onto the tape on those cheap radio cassette machines anyway. Well, that's where there's a slight problem, because midi wave frequencies equal 530 to 1700 kHz. And long wave frequencies, which are used in Europe, are 148.5 to 283.5 kilohertz, and they use very high power transmissions. Bias oscillators work between 40 and 150 kilohertz. They're not that fast. So the sharp eyes amongst you will have noticed that 148.5 is slightly less than 150 kilohertz. So they're in the same area, and this is where the problems arise, at least outside the USA and inside the USA and the rest of Europe when we're talking about. AM or medium wave, we're looking at uh, IF frequencies. So we'll cover them in a little bit. So what's an IF frequency and where does it come from? Right, so we've had the question asked, what is an intermediate frequency? Well, it's simple. Have you ever heard when there is an aeroplane and it's got two engines, you hear it on the war films a lot, and you've got, got the wow, 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 wow. The beat frequency is the wow, wow bit. Rather, rather than the two droning noises, which is the difference between the two engine speeds, so giving you a, a beat frequency. With intermediate frequencies on radios, what they do is they set, they put a local oscillator, which is set offset from what you're trying to receive. So you're receiving, we'll say, one megahertz, and you have a local oscillator within the radio producing a signal of 1.470 or 1.455, whichever the intermediate frequency is, which you can have a look at at the end of the video, there are some, some numbers. So that's what you do, you produce a signal. Trouble with that signal is it leaks out. It is oozing out of the radio. And if you've got a cassette, which has got a, a bias oscillator, which is very close to the local oscillator frequency, or a subharmonic or a multiple harmonic of that frequency, you will get a beat frequency, and that's where the problem comes. Now, it doesn't have an effect on VHF FM, and it doesn't have a f an effect on shortwave, for the simple reason that the numbers are too big. We're talking about 1 megahertz compared to 88 megahertz to 108 megahertz for FM. 
So, you know, it's not going to be within range. But when you're talking about medium wave and long wave, which are within reach, certainly the local oscillator is within reach of the bias oscillator, that's when you get the problems. And that's what the switch does. All it does is moves it by about 10 or 12 kilohertz. The output on the audio of a European, and presumably the same for American, the output on AM radio is only 4.5 kilohertz, possibly 5 kilohertz for American, because the channel spacing is 9 kilohertz. So therefore, you've got plus and minus 4.5 kilohertz. And that's the way it works. Simple. Anyway, on with the video. What you can see there is a crystal radio. This is from 1956, but they went right back to 1920-something. This was obviously a modern one. And, um, modern, here we go. They work very simply. All they are is a capacitor, a diode, and a coil. And that's how it works. There's your coils, there's your capacitor, and there's your diode. Very simple. This is a tube radio from the 50s or 60s. And you see it's got two capacitors there and lots of coils and lots of tubes and is not as simple as the previous thing. This one's got oscillators and intermediate frequencies which is what we're going to look at. Next we have a more modern transistor radio, AM again. As you can see there there's two capacitors and lots of little cans and those cans are all to do with frequencies and oscillators. This is a more modern FM radio with uh, AM as well and again you can see it's got the same sorts of bits in it. This is the diagram for that radio and let's have a look. This is where the aerials come in and it goes straight into a transistor. That's the BF414. Now that transistor is sort of tuned but then you've got all these capacitors, the tuning capacitors, some of which are ganged and then you've got another BF441 which is used as part of this thing there. You've got an FMIF and you've got to have a couple of capacitors and things. Now looking at it again we're moving over now to the AM side and you've got down there, you've got the oscillators, 455 kilohertz IF frequency. That's where it comes from. And it's a clever little circuit. Very simple, but works. And just so you can see it, see these here, they are all tin cans. And that's a gang of capacitors. And if you look on here, there's the four capacitors and there's all the tin cans. This is a typical radio from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and if you look inside, there's not much in the way of, in, of screening, so signals leak. They leak like buckets, and the signals are quite strong. And this is where you get your problem from, because if they're in pro proximity with something else, you get this sort of problem. This is a relatively modern clock radio with AM, and this is a not quite so modern clock radio with AM. What you can hear is the top radio, and I'm about to turn up the volume on the bottom radio, just so you can see that it's different. Now listen to that tone. The top radio is tuned to, to what we'll look at in a minute. There's no actual channel there, but it's on at 1440 kHz. So, and as you can see on here, it's only rough, but there's a scale there. And it says that this is on at 1000 kHz, so 1 MHz, which is 1440 minus 1000 equals 440, which is around about the IF frequency of an average radio. So now if I take the tuning on the bottom radio and adjust it, it's not going to affect the top radio in any way other than by signal leakage. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just stand there. So what I'm going to do, just show you there, the knob at the back is the volume and just turn that up just so you can see that it's this one that you can't hear. Loud, nice and loud, and then we'll turn it back down again. And now we turn the tuning, which is just moving that dial, and it's going to move the local oscillators, and that's what we're going to be hearing. Right, I won't say much over this, just to let you enjoy the delights of heterodyning, which is what it's called, and uh, that's how radios work, but that's the problem you get. Now that tone that you can hear varying about is a beat frequency, is a beat tone, and that is what would happen within a cassette deck if we had it recording, and it was in close proximity to an AM radio. So that's it, that's what a beat cut or beat or mode bias 
adjustment does. It actually changes frequencies so that there's no heterodyning, no beating, no whistling, no screaming. Doing that was actually quite um, therapeutic. I mean, it was a bit of a job finding equipment to actually do it with because there aren't that many old AM radios around nowadays. Most of the modern ones don't leak so much. And that's probably why they don't or didn't have the beat control, the beat switch, on so many of the later decks. But there we go. That's the thing. Now, the, the misnomer between that and the MPX filter. It's simple. What the MPX filter does, and there is a video for it, which you can probably find somewhere around, somewhere around, around there. Oh, yeah. Anyway, there is a video about that. And all that is is a notch filter. It just cuts out the the, the pilot tone from uh, from the stereo. It's 19 kilohertz, and it doesn't need to be there. And uh, if you've got a good tape deck, it could record the 19 kilohertz, and will give you problems with your Dolby and with your if you've got try to set levels up it depends on the quality of your tuner as to whether or not that pilot tone is going to be there so they give you a switch so you can cut it out now this beat cut is nothing to do with that this beat cut is the actual local oscillator being moved uh, either up or down or whatever the bias oscillator so that it doesn't interfere with the if on the radio because the radio isn't feeding the signal out, as in it's not part of the RF or anything like that. It is literally made in the radio, as you just saw on there, and that is what comes out. And it's a bit of a problem, and if it isn't made in the radio, then it's made in the tape deck, which is also a bit of a problem. But the end result is the same. You end up with what's called a beat frequency, which is a whistle or a tone, and it will be on it. The reason it doesn't have a problem with shortwave and FM, as it's known, which is actually VHF, is because the frequencies are so far away from the local bias oscillator that they can't interfere, or if they do, they're going to interfere. If there's any interaction with them, it's going to be, well, you know, you might find that your dog's got a problem, but nothing else is going to happen because they're just so far apart. And that's the way it works. So if you got any value out of that video, I th hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't, well, you know, ha come back another day and try again. But that was of, uh, quite interesting. I enjoyed making it. To be honest, it was quite quite good fun. After I managed, I had to fix that radio. It didn't work; it hadn't been used for about twenty years on AM, and uh, it wasn't happy about it. But there we go. Anyway, like, subscribe, all the rest of it, and catch you another time. Bye bye.